We just want to take a minute to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Scentbird. If you're like me, you probably have a few subscription services, but the package I'm most excited to get every month is from Scentbird. They send me sample bottles of cologne, and of course, they have sample bottles of perfume as well. I think it's a lot of fun to try out new fragrances, and Scentbird is an inexpensive way to do it. You can easily spend $150 to $500 or even more on a bottle of cologne or perfume, but Scentbird is just $16 a month. And it isn't just some tiny bottle you usually get samples in. Scentbird bottles are about 8 times bigger and usually last 30 days. Also, they aren't some cheap no-name brands you've never heard of. They have over 600 brands like Dolce & Gabbana, Prada, and Versace. It's also easy to find new scents because they have a quiz and they'll send you something that matches your personality. This month I got cologne from Malin & Getz, Hermetica, and Mercedes-Benz Select. I really liked all the colognes. They were very bold and unique. But my favorite is the Mercedes-Benz Select. It was fresh and clean smelling. It made me feel classy like I was driving one of their cars, even though I don't own a car. Also, just a reminder, Mother's Day and Father's Day are coming up, and Scentbird makes for a great gift. Scentbird has a great deal for criminally listed viewers. If you use the coupon code CRIMINALLYL, you'll get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. So you'll pay just $7. And great news for my fellow Canadians, Scentbird is now available in Canada, so make sure you check them out, eh? Number 3. John Charles Bullsinger In spring 1986, 62-year-old Gladys Hensley was living in a senior citizen's apartment complex in Eugene, Oregon. She had lived there for about 16 years. Hensley was retired. She had worked as part of a cleaning crew at a local hospital. She enjoyed pastel painting and she also enjoyed playing the organ and the accordion. On June 5, 1986, the police were asked to do a welfare check on the 62-year-old. Her friend had not seen her in a few days. Inside the apartment, officers found the dead body of Gladys Hensley. She had been strangled and stabbed to death. The police determined that the killer entered her ground floor apartment by cutting a window screen and climbing through the window. Although she had not been seen in a few days, the medical examiner thought she had only been killed the day before her body was found. Two weeks later, on June 19, 1986, a mechanic at a car dealership in Oregon saw something odd on an embankment about 20 feet from the parking lot. It turned out to be the bloody, dead body of a woman. She was identified as 33-year-old Janice Dickinson. Dickinson was a single mother of a six-year-old boy. She was last seen walking near a park less than half a mile away from where her body was found. The police believe that she was kidnapped and taken to the embankment. She was then raped, beaten, strangled, and stabbed. Her body was found where she was killed. Although there were differences between the murders, like the victim's ages, and one of them was killed in their home, another was kidnapped and killed in a public area, the police thought it was the work of the same man. Both murders happened within two weeks of each other, and the crime scenes were only ten blocks apart. Plus, the police didn't give exact details, but they said the way the two women were killed had a lot of similarities. The police were worried that it was only a matter of time before the killer struck again but he went quiet. Then, 20 months later, on the evening of February 27, 1988, 73-year-old Geraldine Spencer Tuohy was talking on the phone with her sister. Tuohy lived alone in a house in Eugene. Suddenly, the line went dead. Her sister just assumed that something was wrong with the phone. The next morning, Tui's sister drove over to pick her up for lunch. When she knocked on the door, there was no answer, so her sister peeked in the window. She saw Tui's body on the floor and called the police. Tui had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and stabbed. The police learned that the killer had cut the phone line. He entered the house by breaking down the back door. A few days later, on March 5th, the police released a sketch of someone seen lurking around Tui's home. 
However, it did not lead to an arrest. It wasn't long before the three cases went cold. In August 2000, the cases were reopened with the hope that DNA technology could help crack the cases. The DNA testing accomplished one thing. It confirmed what the police already believed, that the same man committed all three murders. But no match to the DNA was found. 28 years after the last murder, the police reopened the investigation. The police then gave the DNA profile to Parabon Nano Labs. Using the DNA, Parabon Nano Labs is something called snapshot phenotyping. It's a process that develops composite images based on information in the DNA, like eye, hair, and skin color. The police got the results back in September 2017. In January 2018, they released the images. But once again, it did not generate any leads. In May 2018, Parabon Nail Labs started offering a new service called Genetic Genealogy. The process became famous when it helped identify the notorious serial killer, the Golden State Killer, in April 2018. Parabon Nail Labs narrowed down the killer of three women to four men for the police in Eugene. Then the police did an extensive investigation. In February 2022, they announced that they had solved the cases. Using fingerprints and footprints, they eliminated three of the suspects. The police said that the killer was a man named John Charles Bolsinger. Bolsinger was born in September 1957. In March 1980, Bolsinger was 22 and he was living in Magna, Utah. On March 29th, he was in the apartment of a man named Mark Anger. Bolsinger was with 33-year-old Casey Sorensen, who he had met at a bar earlier that day. Anger was away and he was letting Sorensen use his apartment. The next day, Anger returned home and found Sorensen's dead body. She had been strangled to death with an electrical cord. The medical examiner thought she might have been sexually assaulted. Some stereo equipment had been stolen from the apartment. The police learned that Bolsinger had stolen the stereo equipment and he was arrested and charged with second degree murder. He went to trial in April 1981. Bolsinger's lawyer argued that the death was accidental. His lawyer claimed that Sorison had asked Bolsinger to strangle her while having sex and things got out of hand. The prosecution argued that Sorison somehow insulted Bolsinger and he snapped. Bolsinger was ultimately found guilty of second degree murder and he was sentenced to five years to life. On March 7th, 1986, Bolsinger was paroled and he moved to Springfield, Oregon shortly thereafter. Springfield Neighbors, Eugene. Three months after he moved to Springfield, Glass Hensley was murdered. On September 26, 1986, Bolsinger broke into a home in Springfield. The woman who lived there scared him off. He was arrested a few blocks from the apartment and he was convicted of breaking and entering. He was sentenced to five years in prison. He was sent back to the Utah State Prison in August 1987. He stayed incarcerated until December 8, 1987. He then moved back to Springfield. A couple months later, Geraldine Spencer Tuohy was murdered. On March 5, 1988, the police released a sketch of her killer. Two and a half weeks later, the police were called to the apartment of 30-year-old John Bolsinger. He had died by suicide. Bolsinger had not been considered a suspect of the murders until genetic genealogy suggested him as a suspect. The police think it's possible that Bolsinger committed other murders. They are still investigating him and appealing to the public for more information about him. 
Number two, Harvey Marcellin. At 1.45 a.m. on March 3rd, 2022, a man in Brooklyn came across a grocery cart with a shopping bag in it on the corner of an intersection. He started to push the cart and then decided to look in the bag. Inside of it was the torso of a woman. The police looked at the surveillance footage from cameras in the area. They saw someone pushing the cart to the corner and then leaving it there. The footage led them to a building a block away from the intersection. It was a building for elderly members of the LGBTQ plus community. The police reviewed the building's security footage. Six days earlier, on February 27th, they saw 68-year-old Susan Lydon, a building resident, push the cart into the building. But there was no footage of her leaving the building. Lydon had one adult daughter. She was a savvy businesswoman who ran her own jewelry store for many years. She had lived in the building for about eight months. On March 1st, another resident of the building, Harvey Massellan, who also goes by the name Marcellin Harvey, was seen leaving the building. Marcellin is 82 years old and identifies as a woman. In Manhattan, Marcellin and a woman are recorded on CCTV footage at a Home Depot. They purchase a reciprocating saw, trash bags, and cleaning fluid. Then they are recorded entering the apartment building. On March 2nd, Marcellin is seen leaving the building with the cart that Lydon had pushed into the building five days earlier. About six hours later, the man found the torso in the bag in the same cart. The police decided to investigate Harvey Marcellin's background, and they were horrified by what they learned. 59 years earlier, in April 1963, Marcellin, who was identifying as a man at that time, was in a relationship with a woman named Jacqueline Bonds. On April 18, 1963, Marcellin shot Bonds with a 32 caliber handgun in the hallway of her apartment building in Manhattan. Bonds managed to get into her apartment and then into her bedroom. Marcellin followed her and shot her again. Bonds then went into the living room where Marcellin shot her one more time. Bonds did not survive the shooting. There was a witness to the shooting and Marcellin was quickly arrested. She went to trial in October 1963 and she was found guilty of first degree murder. She was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Marcellin was paroled in May 1984 after serving about 21 years and was placed on lifetime parole. Just over a year later, she was arrested again. On November 2nd, 1985, Marcellin stabbed his living girlfriend to death in Central Park. He then cut up her body and stuffed her body parts in the trash bags. He left the trash bags on a street in Manhattan. Not much information about this case, including the victim's name and age, were made public. What is known is that in 1986, Marcellin pleaded guilty to manslaughter. He was sentenced to 6 to 12 years in prison. In August 1997, Marcellin attended a parole hearing. She said that she had problems with women. She was denied parole at that time. Twelve years later, in August 2019, Marcellin was paroled. For both murders, she had spent nearly 54 years in prison. After Marcellin was paroled, she met Susan Lydon on social media and they became friends. The police got a warrant to search Marcellin's apartment. They found bloody saw blades and trash bags. They also found Susan Lydon's head. 83-year-old Harvey Marcellin was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Three days later, on March 7th, a human leg was found in some trash. 
He was determined to be Susan Lydon's leg. The police also found more disturbing surveillance footage. It shows Marcel riding around on a motorized scooter in a 99 cent store. At one point she gets off the scooter. The police said that on the chair of the scooter was one of Lydon's legs. Marcelin was sitting on it as she rode around on the scooter. Harvey Marcelin claims she is innocent. She has pleaded not guilty to the murder of Susan Lydon. The police said they are currently looking for more possible victims. Number 1. Joe Michael Irvin In December 1978, 33-year-old Madeline Furry Liveday lived with her husband and two daughters in Denver, Colorado. Madeline was a nature writer and an ecologist. She had published a science book for kids called The Skeleton Book. On December 7, 1978, Madeline was home with her two daughters, who were three years old and nine months old. A man came to her door and forced his way inside. When Malin's husband, Antonio, returned home from work that day, he found her dead body. She had been stabbed multiple times. The police didn't develop any suspects in the case, and it quickly went cold. Half a year later, on August 10, 1980, 53-year-old Dolores Braha was walking to work in Denver. She had moved to the Mile High City a few months earlier from El Paso, Texas. She worked in the cafeteria at the Fairmont Hotel in downtown Denver. Tragically, she never made it to work. Her dead body was found behind an apartment building. She had been stabbed to death. Four months later, on December 20th, 1980, 27-year-old Gwendolyn Harris went to a nightclub in downtown Denver that she often frequented. The next day, she was found stabbed to death at an intersection of 11 miles from the nightclub. In early 1981, 17-year-old Antoinette Parks was a senior in high school. She was also six or seven months pregnant. Antoinette loved children, and her family thought that one day she would open her own daycare. But that never came to be. On January 24, 1981, she was found stabbed to death in a field just outside of Denver. In just over 13 months, four women in the Denver area were stabbed to death. But the police did not know that they were connected. In fact, it would take decades before they realized they were committed by one man. In June 2013, investigators learned that DNA connected the murders of Madeline Furry Liveday and Dolores Baraha. Two and a half years later, the police reviewed Gwendolyn Harris's case and learned that the DNA found at her scene matched the DNA from the other two murders. Finally, in October 2018, the police connected Antoinette Park's murder to the other three homicides. The police knew that if they found a match to the DNA, it would solve all four brutal, decades-old cold cases. But they didn't have a match to the DNA. In 2019, they started the process of genetic genealogy. It led them to a family who lived in Texas. They eventually narrowed in on a suspect that the police were familiar with. He was Joe Michael Irvin, born on January 25, 1951. Irvin had a bizarre and horrifying criminal past. In August 1969, Irvin was 17 years old and he was living in Fort Worth, Texas. He played on his high school football team. On August 9, 1969, Irvin and a friend were hanging out in the parking lot of a bowling alley in Fort Worth. Irvin and his friend walked up to a car which 21-year-old Rodney Jean Bonham and Larry Holt were sitting. The two college students had just arrived and were playing up bowling with friends. Completely unprovoked, Irvin shot Bonham in the neck. Holt managed to run to the bowling alley unharmed. 
Irvin and his friend fled. Bonham was taken to the hospital. He died four days after he was shot. At the time, the police didn't know who had killed the 21-year-old man. On the day Bonham died, Irvin called Bonham's father. He said, I'm sorry, he's dead, but we all have to go sometime. I'm sorry I shot him. A detective questioned several people who implicated Irvin as the shooter. An arrest warrant was issued for Irvin in late September. It turned out that Irvin had fled to Denver. In Denver, he committed a series of rapes. He was eventually arrested and charged with rape, assault on children, assault with a deadly weapon, and burglary. Irvin pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Irvin told several psychiatrists that he was under a lot of pressure because he was wanted for murder in Texas and this made him mentally ill, so that's why he committed the crimes. Amazingly, Irvin was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Instead of being sent to Texas to stand trial for the murder of Rodney Bonham, he was sent to a psychiatric hospital in Pueblo, Colorado. He spent eight years in the hospital and was released in late 1978. A warrant was still out for his arrest for the murder of Bonham, so it's not clear why he was not sent to Texas. Not long after he was released, he murdered Madeline Fury Livaday. In early 1981, Irvin was arrested for rape in Denver. When he was arrested, the police should have been alerted that there was a warrant for his arrest in Texas. But an administrator accidentally wrote the wrong birth year when she input Irvin's information into the system. Irvin posted bail and he was released. Deborah Sukor was a police officer with the Aurora, Colorado Police Department. Her husband was also a police officer. Cora joined the police force in June 1980. On June 27, 1981, she was out on a solo patrol. She had just finished her one-year probation period. She pulled over 30-year-old Joe Irvin for a traffic violation. Things escalated and Cora started to place Irvin under arrest. But he managed to get her gun away from her and he shot her in the head. The Aurora Police Department has a youth program called Explorers. A member of the Explorers, 19-year-old Gregory Spies, came upon the scene and attempted to help Cor. Spies was shot in the back. After shooting both Cor and Spies, Irvin fled. But he left his temporary driver's license at the scene. Spies survived his wound. 26-year-old Deborah Sukor was tragically pronounced dead. She was the first Aurora Police Department officer to die in the line of duty. The police were at Irvin's apartment within an hour of the shooting. When they found him, he was trying to cut off the handcuffs. He was brought to the Adams County Jail. Four days after he was arrested, on July 1st, 1981, 30-year-old Joe Michael Irvin was found dead in his cell. He apparently died by suicide. He supposedly hanged himself with strips from a towel. He left a note in which he takes responsibility for Cora's murder and asks for forgiveness. After the investigators looked at Irvin's background, they knew they had a probable suspect. In late 2021, they had his body exhumed. They collected a sample of his DNA. It was then compared to the DNA found at all four murder scenes. In January 2022, the investigators got the result. It was a match. 42 years after the first murder, the cases were finally closed. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. You can find a link to the channel on the screen now and in the description box below this video.
Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.